taste of His goodness Find what you're looking for For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him will live forever Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him will live forever The power of hell forever defeated Now it is well I'm walking in freedom For God so loved God so loved the world Praise God Praise God From whom all blessings flow Praise Him Fortress to the one who is in need Unto him who can keep us Make us blameless in his presence Unto Jesus, unto the only God Unto him who has saved us Be all glory, be all majesty Dominion, all authority yours right now and forevermore 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 right now and forevermore 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 your light will overcome the darkness The crooked roads will be made straight 
The valleys lifted up, the mountains brought down low. Every tongue will soon confess your name unto him who can keep us, make us blameless in his presence unto Jesus, unto the only God, unto him who has saved us, be all glory, be all majesty, dominion, all authority is yours, right now and forevermore. Be my all, my 
treasure, my prize. I am yours forever, you're mine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. When I pass through death as I Second Peter chapter 3 is where we're going to be reading here uh, and studying these next few minutes while we're together. Um, as we were singing that song, I was thinking of how thankful I am, church, that you sent us to the uh, pastor's conference at the beginning of last month, and we heard Aaron Williams perform that song that he wrote, that, and, and he told the story behind uh, writing that song, and it was just, uh, uh, I was reflecting on that as we were singing uh, about his thoughts on John 15 and the, uh, the parable of the vine. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, would you stand with me as we give honor to reading God's word together? Hear the word of the Lord. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished but by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. This is the word of the Lord that he has given to us. Let's pray. Our Father, um, we are thankful, so thankful for your grace and your mercy that have kept us to this day. 
So thankful that you, by that grace and mercy, ordained a day that we should set aside to worship you. And thankful, Father, that because of your grace, because of Jesus Christ, we assemble, and brothers and sisters all over our community and around our world assemble today to worship you. Father, as we look into this passage, we are going to once again be confronted with what unbelief looks like and what the purveyors of unbelief are like. And I pray that you would give us continued discernment by your Holy Spirit, boldness, Lord, to speak the truth, and also, Father, help us in ministry as we seek to win the lost. We thank you so much once again for what this word has already said in its reading, and we pray for its affirmation in the preaching of it. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, October 31st has come and gone, and I see most of you came without your masks on today, and I appreciate that. We uh, uh, have fun with that day. When I was a kid, I recall the activities that we would have, usually growing up in a little country church, not a big city church like ours, but a little country church, we had hay rides. That's what we did at, at Halloween time. In recent years, it's become kind of a popular thing to, um, to uh, take and call it All Hallows' Eve, kind of adopting the old Catholic name for it. And uh, they like to call it Reformation Day. I don't know if you have caught on to that, but there are, there are a number of guys that will, will do a service. Kind of an important occasion. You may not know this fact in history, but it was on... Halloween day, it was on October the 31st, that the reformer Martin Luther walked up to the Wittenberg Castle and posted his 95 theses on the door of, of, the, of the castle there. Uh, those, those 95 statements were his statements against the inefficiency, the fact that the Catholic doctrine of absolution of sins did not work, that you could not buy get-out-of-jail-free cards for your sin. But that's what they had done. The priests could sell indulgences so that if you decided to, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, and you felt kind of guilty about it, you could come home, pay the priest an offering, and he would give you an absolution of sin so that all of that was taken care of. Luther was saying that the Bible says that doesn't work. Yeah, that's right. There was one amen to that. The rest of you ought to agree with that. Well, <clears throat> what a lot of folks don't know, unless you're a student of this, this particular history, is when, when Luther was doing this, when this came out, it was a little over 500 years ago, most of the world was just stepping out of the dark ages of illiteracy. You see, it was only about 75 years before that that the Gutenberg Press was invented and they could begin printing books. And books once were a very rare thing that had to be hand copied and they were very expensive and very slow to produce. So, so people didn't own a Bible or any kind of a luxury heirloom book. It was a rare thing. And even those who, who uh, may have wanted one had never gone to school to learn how to read it because materials were so inaccessible. So only the privileged few had the education to read and only the very privileged wealthy had the, uh, the means to own any kind of a library. Most of the information that people received, they received from the mouths of royalty or from the mouths of an educated elite that would tell them what they were supposed to believe. And so 
the masses under the delusion of Roman Catholicism were entirely deceived because of what a bunch of lying priests were saying that they said the authority was with the Pope and in Rome. Well, about a month and a half before Luther posted the 95 Theses, he actually posted another set of theses that are lesser well-known. It was his 97 theses. And in that, he laid out his understanding, his newly discovered understanding of justification by faith alone. You know how he found that out? The Bible was printed, and he was able to go through and read the Scriptures. And he finds that the Scriptures are saying things that are completely contrary to what he is being taught as he is living as a Catholic monk at the time. So an educated man is now actually getting an education as he studies the Word of God. Like the internet today allows a mass of media and information that now seems to flood what once was a very limited market in that day when only a few people could have ever told you what to believe and what to do, now suddenly people have access to actually read the Word of God, or if they can't read, they can hear the Word of God being read, because before Luther's day, it was only written in Latin, because that was the holy language of the Bible, you see. Now Luther translates it into German, and it begins to be read, and people begin to hear, and they hear what the Word of God says, and they hear what the lying priest is saying, and all of a sudden, you have something that is at odds. After the 97 Theses laid out the doctrine of justification by faith, and then he comes out and says, there's no way you can gain an absolution of sins by giving any kind of offering. All of the people, all they could say was amen. That's exactly what the Bible says. And that's what started the wildfire of the Reformation. Now, now as Baptists, we may claim a different history, but let me explain something to you about what happened 500 years ago at the Reformation. That's the story of its start, this mass exodus from Roman Catholicism. If we pinned it down to one thing on which history pivoted 500 years ago, what planted the seeds of the reform of those English Puritans that eventuated the settlement of 13 colonies in North America, that produced the brilliant mind of Jonathan Edwards who saw those first two great awakenings that kind of laid a foundation spiritually for this nation. That revival, eventually founding the very values that form our constitution and laws. If you want my entirely biased opinion about it, it was sola scriptura. It was the Bible alone. People had access to the word of God, read the word of God, and for the first time their eyes were opened by Jesus Christ, and they saw the light. That Reformation doctrine of the Scriptures alone has fueled every sense of Reformation sense and brings revival to churches today. It will fuel ours as we live for Christ. In our recent study, Think Biblically, I'm trying not to fit too much in introduction, but I do want to say something about civic duty that we have this week and that many of us may have already fulfilled. I urged us in that study to not think about the topics that we were to discuss from a political sense, but as it was given to us in the material to think about it biblically. Important subjects that are to be answered by scripture and by conviction. If our nation is to have any meaningful change, that change is not going to come at the ballot box. It's going to come from the Bible and from Christ. One last word on that, because it is election week, if you've not voted already, this is a preserved right for you. I want to encourage you in the unique privilege that you have in the world you have the right to cast a ballot, should exercise that right, but as I urged everyone then, I urge you now. Don't do that based on popularity, preference, or politics, 
but vote with a conscience that's informed by the word of God. Politicians will prove themselves to be fallible. I don't care who you vote for. You're voting for the wrong person if you're not voting because God gave you conviction of it. Okay? They're going to prove themselves flawed. They're going to do things that are unbiblical and immoral. But by our vote, we're not affirming their perfection. We're affirming our convictions. I like what was said in the last lesson that we had. To not think of it as we're voting for the lesser of two evils, but that prayerfully by discernment we would vote for the lesser evil. That's what we do. That what we want is to see the better done for our country and not for the worse. And then when you exercise that right, remember we're voting, we're voting for fallible people. Pray that God will bring revival to our nation. Why all of that? Well, I think it does pertain to what Peter is saying here. Peter's wrapping up life. Doesn't have much more to say. He's already told the people as he wrote them at the beginning of this that the time is coming when I'm going to put off this earthly tabernacle. He's saying, I'm fixing to die. History says perhaps not long after this letter that he was crucified upside down by Roman authorities because of his testament of Christ. Peter was giving an urgent address to the hearers those thoughts had him communicate to us um, an urgent record. I've said in our study that Peter wrote two letters, first and second Peter. History says, some historians say that Peter was also the source of the information for Mark's gospel, that, that Mark was informed by the apostle Peter and that that leaves us Peter's legacy. What has Peter preoccupied himself with in these chapters? He has repeatedly pronounced the name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Seems like he wants us to never forget that's who we're always going to be talking about. Over and again, he has done that. And it's also been his constant theme to remind us, to cause us to remember. This is the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. He is bringing back to our attention things that must be said. These words are the scriptures given to us. These words are the testament of everything that Christ has done and all that will be happened because of his glorious name and because of God. These words are for us like the North Star. It fixes a point for us from which on earth we look and all of the heavens spin round them and determine all cardinal direction. And we never forget whenever Christ himself talks about the word of God, he says in Matthew chapter 5, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. We have an established word that will never change and never disappear. Christ has said that authoritatively. Seeing this truth that God's word is preserved for us, handed down to us, sets our thoughts then, his unchanging word and his unchanging ways. And now in this passage that we have read, Peter brings a fiery conclusion to warn us away from false teachers. Like Luther would do 15 centuries after Peter wrote about it, Peter's combat is directed by two things, God's word, and it directs our attention to God's throne. I want us to consider this thought this morning and then a few things that we can gather from these passages and 
many more we could obviously look at. No revelation brings saints more joy nor sinners more fear than knowing God never forgets nor fails in what he promises to do. Carefully look at it. There's no revelation that brings us no, more joy than knowing God has never forgotten and will never break his promise to you, believer. And sinner, there is nothing that should bring you more fear today than knowing that God never forgets and he will not fail to fulfill his promise against those who will not believe in Jesus Christ. Our thoughts on God's promises are established in his word. The first two verses is Peter's reminder to us that he is giving us a word that is going to last for the generations to come. He says that these are directed to those with a sincere mind. I'm stirring up your sincere mind, the, the pure mind of a believer that is being instructed by the word of God, who is desiring the word of God. We uh, ourselves have almost fallen entirely away from letter writing. Uh, I can remember writing a few letters when I was a young man, but it wasn't long after that that we had email. wasn't long after that we had text messaging, and now literacy is just about out the window. You know, we, we abbreviate everything. But there were tremendous benefits to handwritten letters. They were personal. They were permanent. And they were transmittable. When you got the letter, it was in the handwriting of the person that sent it to you. It was not digital. It could not be altered or amended without considerable effort. It was a, it was a permanent record of what their exact thought was that they concentrated on to put down on that piece of paper. And you could share it with anybody that would hear you read it or that could read the letter. That's what the epistles are, remember? These were originally, not chapter and verse, these were a letter written on a scroll, sent to the church, and here was the word of God, and it addresses those who receive it as the beloved of God. It is this blessed title, this blessed identity of being the pure-hearted ones that the Lord has set his affections on that know the affection of God and of Christ and know his grace. To be known affectionately and known to desire those affections. It is that very desire that's in the heart of God's people that informs us against those who would deceive. Those affections for the word of God keep us from stumbling. The past weeks I've been reading, took a few days in the Bible reading plan that I use each year, Psalm 119, verses 103 and 104. Look at what he says. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. It is the word of God that was informing the psalmist against those who would otherwise deceive him. He hates every false way because the truth of God's word abides in him. Even as we look at this passage, God's instruments of revelation, the authors of the Bible were directed to us because of God's promises that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Peter names three sources through whom God gave us his word, the prophets and the apostles and Jesus Christ himself. 
the prophets and the apostles, we already have studied this in 2 Peter, provided us scripture under direct inspiration. It was the work of the Holy Spirit in them. We saw that in 2 Peter chapter 1, knowing that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along or as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Prophets foretold of Christ. The apostles reminded us of Christ. Why was it that all of this attention and all of this affection was set on the person of Jesus? We understand I think so clearly when we read what the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. We gain from Scripture a perspective on the person of Christ because of what the prophets said he would be and what the apostles said he was. And in Jesus, we have the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise to date and in him rests our hope in all of God's future promises. Whether we're considering in our reading of scripture the seed of the woman, the coming seed of of Abraham the lamb to redeem captive Israel, the descendant of David that will establish his throne forever, the coming anointed one that the prophet said was going to be here and fulfill God's promises of the covenant. Every single revelation, every single prophecy points us to Jesus Christ and to Calvary. Any promise remaining unfulfilled only awaits what will be fulfilled on Christ's final return. The word of God has given all of that to you and I as apostles and prophets and even from the lips of Jesus Christ himself. And Peter says, your sincere minds by way of reminder, this is being written down according to all of those things given to us by holy prophets and the commandments of our Lord through the apostles. Our thoughts on God's promises protect our mind from lies. We already saw what the psalmist said. He hates every false way. Protects our minds from lies. Now the larger section of what we have read, verses 3 through six, talks about the methods of the false false teachers. Historically, false teachers always call God's revelation of history into question. False teachers say, don't believe the Bible. Science says this. Then pretty soon they find out that science and the Bible agree because the Bible actually reveals what Scientists think they were discovering for the first time. <clears throat> Though we can cite similarities in verse 3 and 4 against what false prophets said in the Old Testament, Peter, notice, speaks entirely of revelation about what future false teachers are going to say. Scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. That's good. Scoffers are going to scoff. He makes that simple for us. He doesn't use any extra words. What are they going to do? How are they going to scoff? Following their own sinful desires, they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And Peter says, oh, really? just like they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing has changed, is what they are saying. Remember, 
He's not guessing. This is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit exactly how to answer such a scoffing accusation. Where is the promise of his coming? Does the world continue just as it was from creation until now? Peter could shout, just look at Christ. Something has changed. Paul, John, Peter, every testament we have from the apostles warn us about these coming false teachers. We were informed by the prophets about what was coming as the Old Testament is closed out. A warning of judgment is coming. The false teachers are saying it's not going to. It's been predicted for so long, but they would point to Malachi, who says in chapter four, behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch for you who fear, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves in the stall. The false teachers mock prophecies like this saying, uh, when is this finally going to happen where injustice is going to be once and for all punished? The sinner once and for all, the recipient of the wrath of God and the saint once and for all ransomed from their pains and sorrows. They scoff. However, Peter, remember now, a fisherman. I mean, he's more than just common folk. He, he is very common. We're not talking about a man who had any kind of perceivable formal education. They perceived that he was an unlearned man, that the only thing different about Peter and everybody else around him was that Peter had walked with Jesus. That's, that's what we know about Peter. Now, now let me just highlight for a moment here what the Holy Spirit shows us about the wisdom of the word of God. Highly educated and perhaps very convincing false teachers are going to say that this world has just continued along just like it has from the creation of the world. Peter hears that and he says, oh, oh, really, is that what you think? But what does the Bible say? It says everything was changed by a big flood. That's what it says. That everything was rolled over by water is what the Bible says. For any false teacher to say that things have just continued as they are from the creation of the world is entirely false because there has been at least one global catastrophe that marked the lives of every single human being on this planet. Without claiming one ounce of modern knowledge, that creation scientists would use to apply what the scripture says about the credibility of the flood, Peter rested his thoughts on, on just a couple of things. It says, they deliberately overlook this fact. <laughs> Don't you love this? this? This is a simple guy that says, they're overlooking one thing, that it says... The heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. He, he says, but the Bible says that there was this expanse of water that put water over earth and that had water under the earth. He's informed by Genesis 1, 6 and 7 where God says, let there be this expanse in the midst of water to separate the waters, and God made this. It was so. All he's doing is just saying what you're saying goes against what the Bible says. Water. He says, not only was it 
above the earth, but also that, that there was water below the earth, right? They overlooked that it was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and by, by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. In Genesis 1, verse 6, excuse me, it's Genesis 6, Genesis 7, I'm reading to you from. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. What was Peter noticing is what Scripture says. The overlooking the fact that there was water that the Scripture says was above the earth. Water was below the earth. It bursts up from the ground. It falls down from the heavens and it destroys everything that was in hand in this demonic rebellion that was marking that entire generation. Every reprobate person in the world who refused to heed the warning of God, perished outside of that ark. It was all magnificently coordinated, created for God's exact purpose to completely destroy a rebellion against him and against his glory. Our thoughts on that carry us to our last observation this morning where Peter is going with this absolutely goofy argument that the false teachers were purveying regarding their belief that the coming judgment was false and would never happen. Our thoughts on God's promises set our hopes on future glory. In verse Seven, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for the fire, for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Let's give a first consideration to what Peter is saying there. Now, Peter, knowing that fire, or excuse me, that water fell from heaven and water sprang from the earth. Waters above and waters below came down and came up to cause total destruction. It doesn't take much for you and I to watch the sky some evenings and we'll see some fiery ornament pass through the sky. History has even allowed our world to continue even when great, massive, flaming objects have slammed against the crust of the earth, colliding with our planet and causing immense devastation. We can also observe that we stand on a very thin crust that preserves us right now from fire that is just below us. From where we stand, or where you sit, where I stand, it's about five miles to Bald Knob, right? Do you know the deepest mine shaft in the world is in South Africa? It's a gold mine. It goes two miles underground. Now, when we go into a cave, you all know how cold it is in a cave, right? I think it feels wonderful. I think it'd be so nice to preach in a cave be awesome. I know where there's a pulpit in a cave where they used to conduct revival services in Missouri. I think we ought to go there for a retreat one day. But do you know what they deal with at two miles below the earth's surface? It's 150 degrees down there because they're getting so close to the magma layer of the earth, the fire. They have to pump ice 
down a long shaft to cool the place cool enough because you remember it's hot enough outside to cook eggs on the sidewalk. That's 130 degrees of thermal load that gets in into concrete and can cook an egg. It's 150 degrees down there. They've got to cool it down because it's literally going to cook the people that are working down there. Can you think of this? That in the creation, God put water below the earth and above the earth for coming destruction by flood and that Peter says he perceives that God has put everything in place for fire above and fire below to consume all things. You see, it's, it's in Peter's mind just as God created a world with instruments of former destruction above and below that God has preserved means of final destruction, a testament to the fiery end of all ungodliness. In Revelation 20 and verse 13 through 15, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 21 and verse 8, as for the cowardly, faithless, detestable, as for murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. There is preserved a fiery judgment on all false teaching. And Peter says, these who boast and try and lead others into doubting what God's promises are first, need to be reminded of the former world that was destroyed by flood and the promise that a God who never forgets is going to be, bring judgment by fire that he's prepared for all unbelievers. One final thought or how these things have all been predestined of God and are from God's perspective, not ours. I don't think that there's one verse in Scripture that should humiliate us more than reading 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The greatest works of man, the marvels of the world, are something that took multiple lifetimes to accomplish. And yet, in a blink, God sees them turn to dust. Because a thousand years is as one day. Every great thing that we think that we would accomplish for ourselves or all that they believe that they testify to their own greatness, these lust-filled deceivers who deny the word of God don't realize that at this very moment, that it is just a blink before they stand before the God of eternity who will be the judge of their souls. The promises that God made 2,000 years ago are just as sure to be completed today as they will be if history perpetuates long enough for our bones to become dust and all we have built to be buried under the silt of the White River. Time has no gravity on our eternal God. He does not wait. And even if it's another thousand years, he is not waiting. Even if it's a million years, he is not waiting. He is eternal and we warn others what he has revealed of himself. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Hear the word of the Lord. He will not forget. Child of God, this is the great joy of our hope. 
He will not forget. He will never forget his promises that are ours in Christ. And sinner, you hear this. If you don't heed the call to come to Christ today and be saved, God will not forget your rejection of his beloved son. And all that the scripture says in these words that we have read, all that we have studied there, as heavy as they are, they are words reserved for you for all eternity. Suffering and the complete wrath of God who will hold you accountable for every sin that you have committed against Christ. And the only hope that you have for freedom from that, for redemption from that, is to run to him today so he can save you in the name of Christ. Come to Jesus. He can save you from your sins.